Nina Bartram. I work with a firm called Atelier One and we're structural engineers, in fact, very close to here. Um, I gave as the title of the lecture, Lightness and Engineering. And I did that because there's been so many people come into our office and really what they're trying to get from us is, is to achieve some kind of lightness that they think they're not managing to get through conventional means. And I don't know why, more recently, people have been using the term lightness more and more. It's become almost like a catchphrase. I don't, in terms of science, you know, things have been getting lighter and lighter. In, you know, molecular studies, you have DNA and neutrinos, things which are so light that they actually hardly have any mass at all. And in terms of computers, you're suddenly going into a realm which is hardly material. So perhaps it's not surprising that we are trying to escape the more physical aspects of the world and trying to find something which is less definable. So I tried to start off by thinking, well, what is lightness? And in English, it has so many meanings. You know, it can be a physical mass. In engineering terms, you talk about lightness and heaviness. Um, if you were a lighting engineer or something like that, you talk about lightness and darkness. But then there's a more abstract sort of definition, which in the 19th century meant it was something quite frivolous. Oh, it's light, it's kind of, it's nothingness. Whereas weight was profound, it was serious, it was, you know, what you were meant to produce. Um, but we're sort of finding that there is lightness and thoughtfulness. And the quote that everyone uses is Paul Valery, who says, you should be light like a bird, not light like a feather. And Italo Calvino, who uses this quote, says, for him, lightness means precision and determination, not vagueness and haphazardness. And that brings me back to the engineering, which is that engineering can actually be incredibly imprecise. A lot of things built, even until about 50 years ago, and even being built now, are really done by rules of thumb with factors of safety of, fifth, you know, so, so such great factors of safety that there is no, they're, they're not honed down to a sort of a fineness that you might find in other realms of engineering like aerospace or aircraft. But we now have all the resources that other technologies have. We have very advanced computer programs. We have materials now that we understand more and more about and that we can carry out ever-increasing tests on. And so we really do now begin to have the tools that give us that precision and that determination that allows us to create structures which are really light. I tried to identify, following Italo Calvino, just ways in which you can define lightness, and that basically I've split them into three categories. I'm going to look quickly at those, and then I'll move on to projects from not just our office, but also things that have inspired me. So if I can turn off the lights now, I'll go on to the first slide. Um, the first way I thought of lightness was a reduction of the language. Um, I, you reduce something so much that it takes on an extremely rarefied consistency. And this is a Brancusi bird. It's not actually the sculpture I was looking for, which was his forms in space. But Brancusi talks about the fact that when you think about birds or when you think about fish, you don't always think about the scales or the, or the feathers of a bird or its talons you think about its speed, you think about the way it moves through the air. And it, when he's in his sculptures, he tries to express that. And he says, if he'd put all the feathers on the bird, it would have detracted, you would have, your eye would be caught by a pattern or a shape on the sculpture. It wouldn't actually, you'd be detracted from its speed. And what he wanted to portray was his spirit, not, not the physicality of it. And this, this is actually another sculpture by Brancusi, which is the, uh, I think is the Everlasting Tower. So I think that's way, one, way, one way where it begins to, you get this very rarefied form. And in engineering, this is a project I'm going to come back to, and you'll, you'll see why. These are the Gerberet from the Pompidou Center, and they're massive. They're huge pieces of cast steel. And yet, I'm sorry about the slide, when they're actually in position, they're incredibly light. They're very detached from their surroundings. And they, you lose that 
that sense that they are such huge pieces. Another one of my inspirations was, this is Pierluigi Nervi, and this is a stadium just outside Florence. And again, I think with the steps, you begin to lose the feeling of steps and you have more the feeling of travel, something traveling upwards towards the end, towards the top layers. So that was one of the meanings I found for lightness. The other meaning, or the second I went on to, was a discourse, the juxtaposition of lightness and darkness, or heaviness and mass, but bringing that to a high degree of abstraction. So these are James Tyrrell, who is, um, works with light, and he creates just completely floating spaces just by using light. Um, and this is Louis Kahn, Phillips Exeter Library where again, the lightness of the top is uh, emphasized, or the, the, the contrast between the heaviness and the lightness is emphasized by the large cross he places across the top of the building. Um, and this is um, Ian Ritchie, the extension to the Reina Sophia Museum. And in this, the very lightness of the tower contrasts with the heaviness behind, which is of the old museum to which this is the extension. And then the final and possibly the most simple image of lightness is just transparency or, you know, it, it's the very simplicity. And this is a sculpture pit pavilion in the Netherlands uh, by Bentham Cruel. And again, in this one, I th sometimes you almost feel the simplicity gets so far that you do, you lose it, you lose, there is no, not the contrast perhaps that you have in the earlier ones. So, I'm not so sure about the discourse. So if I move on to projects and perhaps talk about how the engineering, what, how these very much affect the engineering, we'll be, um, I can begin to talk about, uh, I think it'll begin to come to light what I'm trying to get across. The first project for which I was kind of looking at a kind of abstraction is that the architect here wanted to create a, flo a floating plane in space and he just wanted something very thin and very, you know, sort of that you'd hardly notice. And this is a pool house. It was done for a private client at Atelier One. Uh, we were the engineers. And I think in many ways it succeeds. You do get, there is no visible, when you're inside the pool house, you get ab absolutely no idea of how the thing is supported. Um, looking out, um, that's upside down. <laughs> but you can uh, see how it would go. You, you just get a clear view out. Um, but this is what you see outside. Um, it's, a very, it's a very heavy structure that goes right across the top. It has to span 20 meters. Um, this is a model of it. Because we couldn't put any props down right across the length, and we couldn't put props down on either side because you had windows out, basically there are only two places to pick up and that was along the length, but that means you have a 20 meter long beam, and more than that, you have a 20 meter long beam that has very long cantilevers, five or six meter long cantilevers, um, which if I do it, th those are the long cantilevers on either side and a shorter one to the back, which means that the whole thing, not only does it want to sort of sag down that way, but it also wants to sort of overturn in this direction, now, the way we got around the overturning is that there's actually a tie there and a tie there, and that keeps the balance in, in that plane. But it doesn't stop the fact that you've actually got this sort of one meter deep sort of truss going across the top. The whole thing could sort of be split down into elements, and this shows how it was put together as a series, how it was actually built, which was this, this, the truss down the middle and then a series of frames which were all prefabricated, brought onto site, and then put down, and then the cladding was put underneath. The second um, of these kind of, what I wanted to talk about was sort of almost like floating objects, is the Cardiff Bay Visitor Center, um, which probably most of you know, it was designed by Will Orsop, and Neil, who's the director of the firm I work for, worked on this with him. And Basically, the, if you ever see Will's paintings of it, Will Allsop's paintings, they're of a kind of floating ellipse. And there again, you can see with the light underneath, it really emphasizes how much it floats. 
Now, this was put together as a series of basically curved steel frames. But one of the things is, if you just stack up frames, like one after another, like this, they all, the slightest load in that direction, and they all just want to go down like a load of cards. And normally in a building, you'll end up with cross bracing or you know, quite large joints. But what they did here was they used the plywood and they fixed it so it formed like a continuous skin inside. And the fact that it's a continuous skin doesn't actually mean that you can't take out areas of it. It's like a truss or a beam. You can certainly cut out areas of it. And what's interesting here was, of course, that they were taken out, they went on site and basically said, let's take it out here and take it out there to create, to completely, although it's a constant member and it's acting as a plane, it actually means that it breaks up the solidity of what is actually something quite that is acting very much as a unified piece. Um, that's another shot showing the frame with just the ply on it. Um, oops, and another one that's sideways. Um, that shows better how things began to sort of connect. Um, but the other thing that really works is the way it, it floats at night and, or just during the day, the way the whole thing is picked up off the ground. And that's really done um, because of the way it's all the loads, all the vertical loads are brought down to one point, which is the base of those triangular supports. And then the stability, very much like in the pool house, is just kept in by very, very light cable members on either side, which means that the whole thing can't rock, but you don't have to have really heavy supports. And when you looked at this is, you know, going up a scale, that's the Grand Bleu by Will Allsop in Marseille, and you realize that's another way of picking up something like that, which is with legs. Now, I, on this scale, they certainly couldn't have done what we did at Cardiff Bay because bringing some, or, well, it would have been a lot heavier. You could have done it. Um, and, but it's, it gives a totally different feel. It certainly doesn't give that kind of floating feeling that having the two ties did. Um, the third project in the same category of these kind of objects which float or are sort of rarefied. Oh, that's, sorry, just a, a final view of the ties. And um, I'll also mention the fact that it was wrapped in a PTFE coating, the whole thing, for weatherproofing. It's a big membrane, this, this thing outside, which went round um, the ply. And actually, it lets a lot of light in while creating a waterproof. And it doesn't have, you don't have problems like you'd have with glass of taking up the shape, because you actually pattern it like you'd pattern a dress to fit around the, the ellipse. Um, coming back to the Pompidou, which is kind of one of my inspirational buildings, I suppose, although it's very, um, the engineering is all there to be seen, which I think is less so in, in Atelier One's projects. Um, and uh, what I was talking about earlier, which were the gerberettes, um, which are, if you can see them, they're these elements here. And what they do is they span across the space which is used for circulation. So if you were to look at the Pompidou Center in, in section, you have the exhibition space which is inside, and then you have this additional space outside which is still part of the building but is for circulation. Um, and that kind of expresses it. So this is that internally where you see that, that, that will basically repeat across. That's the internal section, and then this is the circulation space. Um, this is from Peter Rice's book, um, An Engineer Imagines. He was the engineer for this. And he talks about the various conventional ways you could have done this. So they need basically something which goes from that point to that point. Now, you could have put columns here and here, but then you don't get the differentiation. You could have put columns there, 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 and there, but again, you've got something quite solid coming down the outside. So what they have is basically a truss, um, and the other thing with putting a beam right across and supporting it at four points like that is that the bending moment, I'll try and sketch it out in the light, does that. So actually your thickest points are around there, which is where you don't want them to be. So what they do is this actually, the gerberette, acts as a kind of, if I come up here, acts as a cantilever, and it's balanced by the tie. So if you think of a cantilever as like a springboard, the thing that stops the whole thing from just sort of pivoting around there is the fact that it has this tie in place. And then 
the load is from the truss is put on there, which means you get a very, very light connection here. You get the heavier connection in this massive cast steel at that point. But it's, although it's very heavy, it's sort of, it's ex I'll come to the, that connection in a minute. It's, it's expressed quite lightly. And then just a very light tie again around the outside. Um, and this sort of shows you, it's pretty dark, I'm afraid, but it begins to show you how that detail around the, um, around the, the gerbret is expressed because basically it's like a rocker joint. So you get a gap all the way around it. So it doesn't, it doesn't really touch the other members. It's not as if everything clumps together in a great clash at that point. But in, from its sort of scheme design down to its detailing, there's a lightness by leaving that gap all the way around, you actually get, a, I think, you get a much lighter feeling to that connection than you would otherwise. Let's see. You can sort of see it there. There is, it's, you can imagine if that had all been welded together, what a mass that would be. Right. Um, the second, the next project I wanted to look at more in terms of the difference between light and dark. And it's a bank building in Kiel in Germany, which again um, was mainly worked on by Charles Walker in our office. And it's a series of concrete shells, barrel vaults, on very, very slender columns under which the bank building sort of sits. Um, the, let's go on to the next. It, you can begin to get an idea of the, the way it was formed from precast shells which had these um, cutouts shaped into them. And these are actually all concrete. They're very, very thin. They're only a couple of centimeters. And in fact, the shells themselves are only 13 centimeters thick. They're, they're very, very light. Um, and that's kind of the finished, how it finished up. Now, one of the things about concrete is that self-weight is terribly important when you're designing with it. Um, unlike steel, which you then clad, concrete forms the mass of what you're producing. It's, and its weight can be one of the most significant things that you're actually designing for. You know, as great as the load of people on it, um, great, much, much greater than any wind loads or snow loads norm than you'll normally get on them in, say, England. So, if you can decrease the weight of it, then not only do you get a more efficient structure in the concrete, but you also get much lighter things like columns and foundations and everything else that supports it. So the search for a sort of lightness as in physical mass with concrete is actually of vital importance. But one of the problems is if you had just a flat piece of concrete and you halved its thickness, you might halve its weight, but you reduce its stiffness, i.e. how much it deflects, by an eighth, which means that it would actually sag quite a lot. So it's a kind of balancing act by how much you reduce the thickness to um, how much you allow it to move. And that's why a lot of concrete structures, like the nervy um, uh, stairs that I showed earlier, or if you know Felix Candela's work, they often use curves and shell shapes to give stiffness through the geometry, because if you have something which is this kind of shape, actually it acts like a beam which is that depth, you know, a meter deep. Um, in, and, and so you can begin to use the shape to give, you, um, to give you the stiffness you need while you're using, you're not using a concrete section which is a meter deep. Now, in years, when people like Candela or Nervi were working, the way to do this was almost, the way to calculate how these things worked was, you know, very, very difficult. There are certain manual methods, but they're very approximate. Um, and so, generally, it was done by testing. And if any of you have seen the famous Candela photograph of one of his shells with something like 50 Mexican workmen all standing on top of it, smiling, um, and <laughs> I don't know if I would have been in that situation, they, then you, you all know what it's like. I mean... This is to show you what was done in the past. This is Frank Lloyd Wright, Johnson Wax. No one believed that these would carry the load. They were going to, so they did a test, 
and actually they carried 11 times the load they were meant to. So in some ways they're grossly over-designed, but you know, they're still very elegant. Um, but now we have computer programs which allow us, um, can actually do the calculations to the precision that is almost impossible by hand. Um, and this is one of the results. Um, I'm just showing you how this is one of those barrel vaults, and it's supported here, 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 and here. You can sort of see the stresses. This is showing you the stresses in this direction, the longitudinal direction, in which case it's acting as a beam. As I was saying, it, you've got the depth. If you think about it in, plan, in section, it's doing that. So you've got, just as with a beam, you've got the highest stresses in the center, and you've got sort of compression and tension, compression at the top and tension at the bottom happening. But because it's also um, a vault, and you will know that things like arches and vaults tend to act in compression, then when you add on the stresses in that direction, um, this is the kind of more like the resultant you get. And what you find is that you have areas in this sort of area, this one's not such a good example in a way, that actually are very, um, are quite low stressed. And that's where we began to take away the concrete for those cutouts. And what happened was the cutouts were shaped in the end to exactly, the, we used the computer sort of cut, um, this sort of result to cut, find out which areas of the concrete we should cut away. And by cutting away the concrete that's not working very hard, you're actually making an even more efficient structure because the structure is carrying less weight again. So, you know, it's, it, it all comes round. So it was a very efficient way to, to work this out. Um, this begins to show, um, I'm just coming back to the actual design. The actual, um, the shells were actually cast in two halves because, um, I'm just wondering if there's a better, um, let me go back. If you think about it, um, that is an almost, that's a very flat section and that's a very flat section. Whereas to cast that piece as a whole, you have something which is one meter deep. It's very difficult to transport and it's much more difficult to get it precisely, um, to get the finish that we needed. Because these aren't, there is no finish on top of the concrete, they're just painted. The finish was, um, that was produced in the factory was so good that you could just put them up. Um, the other thing, let's, oh, sorry, let's go forward now. Um, coming back, this was to look at the columns. And if you notice, the columns are very, very slender, which again has a tendency to make the thing appear quite light um, because they're slender compared to their length. They're very long. And one of the reasons is that the vaults are tied across, which takes out any thrust from the, um, the arches thrusting outwards, but also, which is not very clear there, there's actually a pin joint there, which means that you only get vertical loads down into um, the column. And there's no moments or anything like that, which is when you find that with most, with a lot of connections, you end up putting, if they're very slightly off center, you can start making, it's just like trying to put any load slightly off center on something, it tends to make it want to sort of flip out or buckle. But if you can actually use a machined fitting at the top that is so accurate that you know that everything's going to be within sort of a couple of millimeter, millimeters of the center, then you know that all your load is coming down the bottom, uh, go, sorry, coming s vertically straight down, the buckling loads are very much reduced. And so you can actually use very, uh, you know, a section like this, which is is remarkably slender. Um, on the, just continuing, this is, um, again, this was just looking at lightness and darkness. It's a very bad photo, I'm afraid. Um, this is a house that's going up in Hampstead, and it's still on site, so there's a lot, this is a bit of scaffolding here. Um, a lot of the emphasis is created by areas of light and dark strips um, of light. And this is the back facade. Um, this is actually the reflection of a wall. There isn't a wall in there, I was told to say this. But if you notice, there's a gap that does this across the whole of the back. 
so that actually this whole back wall dematerializes into something which is not really acting structurally, which it isn't in a way. Because what happens is very similar to what happened at the pool house. There's a very large beam at the top here that goes all the way around the top of the building. And then there's a hanger inside that that comes down and picks up the bottom there. And, there, and then the whole wall is sort of hung on that. Um, the architect for this is, was Rick Mather. And uh, it's, it still hasn't been completed. But when they um, took the proper way, everyone went away for the weekend because we were all terrified that the whole thing was going to disappear. But uh, apart from a really small crack here, which is sort of, we were semi-expecting, the whole thing was fine. Um, and these are just some other photos from the interior, just beginning to, s to show that there are a lot of roof lights with you know, you, an unsupported edge, so that you move from the lightness here into the, into the space inside without the break of a large support or a wall or something like that, which tends to sort of um, change the space totally. And that's uh, another view inside the same house. Um, the final thing I was talking about was just complete transparency. And this is back to the bank building. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about this as a project, but one of the parts was just hang a glass, block, hang a glass box inside um, from, the, from the concrete shells. And this is, it's, there's a just basically a series of um, cables, catenaries across the top. And then the glass just hangs from there like a glass facade would. But it brings me on to the last project I want to talk about, which I'm going to try and look through. It's a scheme we've been working on in the office, and it's really only at, in, in quite early stages. But I wanted to show kind of the stages we went through to try and um, get to what we hope might be a, a built result at some point. Um, and it's a scheme for an atrium. I'm sorry, this is a really bad slide. Uh, and this was the very first. Um, sketch we got from the architect, which I don't think is going to focus. Um, and basically, it was for a glass box. But they had, if you can, you can just about see on that slide, there's a lot of cross bracing and quilting and things coming up and down. So we started to build sketch models. Um, and it started off actually with walkways around the four corners. And this is quite a big space, it's 40 meters by about 28 meters. Um, and we were looking at this, and we just felt that with the architect, we, that this, who are um, CFA planning, who are in Frankfurt, and this is where it's going to be built, um, there are actually, just to bring it into context, there are office buildings coming off this way. You can just see the corners of them, and that way, stretching off. And this is like the entrance point, and where they will, you know, they're going to have events and things like that. But it was felt that by having walkways all around the edge, you basically had a big empty space. And if you were going to make it a big glass box too, you were reducing things to such an extent that there was no dynamism, there was no contrast. So we, first of all, we moved the side in, which is this model, the side walkways, because the main entrance was here. And then we went further, and um, we began to move all the walkways in to create something which begins to spiral in on itself. Um, there was an environmental reason as well. You, you can always find reasons for what you do, good sensible reasons, um, which was that with the glass walls, which are going to be only slightly tinted, the further away you were from the glass, actually, the better it was for direct sunlight. Because if you were right next to the facade, no matter what we did with shading, you were going to get very hot as you walked across or if you had to stand there and watch a performance. But also it began to create a sort of tighter space through which you were going to see things. Then the, the other part um, that we were looking at was the roof structure and the facades. Now, the architect had always seen the roof structure as being a table, basically. But he didn't want it to be a very heavy table, but they did want some columns um, which uh, ended up supporting these corners of the... Um, the walkways. So, first of all, he said, can we make it a tree? So we looked at tree structures, but it began, we thought, looking up at that, you'd actually see a huge space frame, which is actually quite deep in this area. 
and then it's very, very regular, and it, it's sort of, it's getting away from what we wanted to do. And then we went for the completely mad idea, which was, why not just make it um, a, ten a ten segrity structure, which was that something that is basically just two cables stressed against each other to create, um, so that if you have downwards loads, one of the cables goes into tension, and if you have upwards loads, the other cable goes into tension. The main problem with this was that you need, if you think about holding a, um, a tight cable and putting a load on it, your hands really want to come inwards. And you can imagine the forces of holding 40 meters of glass up around these edges, the points where all these cables came into were going to be massive. And the German engineer who designed the, the buildings, the office buildings, which were just about, of course, to go on site, were saying, but we haven't designed them for this. You can't do it. So we had to sort of abandon that plan. Um, and this, these were just some of the inspirations that we were working from. This is by um, a German engineer called Georg Sleich. And it's... Um, Instead of, I was talking about using a tensegrity structure that just used tension, here he's using a shell structure that just uses compression and uses the shape to give him the, um, the stiffness he needs. And that's a very, very simple structure. And in just, just in one or two areas, it's had to be stiffened by radiating cables. But they're so light that you tend not to notice them. But we knew that we couldn't put so much shape into the roof because effectively they wanted something as close to flat as possible. So this was not an option, but I think you know, moving from this was how we got onto looking at tension structures instead, by inverting things. Um, and this is kind of, it's not a very, it doesn't show very well what happened, what we came up with, but it was basically, we kept a tree structure, but it was four very, very slender struts. And then on top of it, you had, um, let me see if there's a, a better, something much more, this is actually um, Roissy in France, um, which was engineered by Ovarup. It's, we ended up some, with something much more like this because we realized we couldn't have this as a tension member, so we made it into a compression member. But unlike this, we didn't want all the diagonals, so, um, it's actually just vertical members going up to support the roof. Um, and that begins to give you an idea of what it, of what it was looking like. Um, and the thing with having this curved underbelly was that we started to look at how we could put shading in, if they needed to in summer and start creating interference patterns between the top surface and the bottom surface using the curve of the bottom to sort of interfere with what was happening at the top. Um, and that's a kind of very technical section through. It's all in, uh, sorry, very bad German. If you speak German, you can probably spot spelling mistakes everywhere. Um, so you can sort of see it just sort of curves down, and then it has a light members going upwards, and the glass is supported across here. The facades were the final part of the project, and they really just wanted something stretched. They wanted as close to nothing as we could possibly achieve. Um, and most facades tend to, now, when people try and achieve nothing, they go to, this was the first planar glazing. It's the, um, uh, what, it's the, at the Science Park at La Villette. And again, it was engineered by Peter Rice at Ovarup. And it was groundbreaking in its time. Um, and it uses tension cables in both directions, rather as I was describing for the roof to take out all the lateral wind loads. But it takes it back to quite heavy structure, which is just off here, but you can sort of see part of it in that area. Um, and we didn't really want to do that. We felt there were almost like too many cables going on there. And that trying to, if you're on the, if you're vertically onto that, then if you're looking straight onto it, you, everything disappears. But the minute you turn, you tend to catch cables disappearing off in other directions. Um, and this was much more our inspiration, which is again Jörg's life. And it's, uh, this is um, um, smaller, it's about 18 meters. And it's a roof, it's single glazed. And it is just cables going across with clamp plates um, holding, th holding the glass in place up here. It's got a very, very big concrete ring beam running around it. All of these things we didn't have, but we were trying not to let it deter us. 
Um, we also had double glazing to try and moderate the, um, the temperature within, which causes more of a problem because here they put the cable actually sort of very close to the glass, but with double glazing it gets much more difficult. Um, so what we ended up with was a cable net, very similar to what you just looked at, stretched between these points. And then we stiffened up the edge of a roof truss slightly, and then it also so it spans in two directions. Um, the main problem with that is that, I mean, there are two things. One is coming back to the point that these things could not have been designed many years ago. Cables, and if you came to Mike Barnes's lecture a few um, weeks ago, he, would, he might have shown you some of the computer graphics he has to do membrane structures. But a cable, depending on how much it moves, the tension in it changes. So you have to, it's an iterative process. You say, I think under this load it will move 50, 500 millimeters, say. You go through, you find out what the tension is there, you find out what the difference is between your initial assumptions, you go back to the beginning and you start again. If you do this by hand, it has a tendency, it's very, very tedious. And in the end, it's only as approximate as you are, which if you're doing it on a small calculator, is only like two decimal points and soon you start veering off. But there are computer programs, of course, which can do this much, much faster. Having said that, when we ran this on our, one of the top computer programs, it took three and a half hours just to do one facade. So you can imagine how long it would have taken one person. Um, and, and a flat cable net is even more difficult because when you start, it has, it's, it's got nothing. It's got no geometric stiffness, i.e. it has no shape to give it stiffness. And it has no material stiffness because a cable is so small that it actually has no stiffness at all. So computer programs also have a tendency to crash the minute you put them in because zeros, th these, these, I'm saying it has very small stiffness. Things get close to zero and then um, computers don't like that. So we ran this, and we did check it by hand, but very much more um, roughly. And we were finding that in the center, because this is 28 meters, under the very worst storm wind loadings, that was going to move about eight, 80 centimeters, which is not a problem in a way, because it's not going to cause failure. Nothing was breaking. Um, and the glass could just about take it. But the client was just saying, you're, you're giving me a structure that's going to move 80 centimeters. You know, I, I can't cope with this. So in the end, we had to put in props, um, which go back to the walkways and are on this line, so that in effect, when, the, when it deflects under wind load, it, has a te it does that. It sort of, it, it's held steady there, and then it deflects between that. And now it's got deflections much, you know, still high for, no for normal rigid structures, but much, much lower than the 80 centimeters we started with. Um, that's just beginning to look, sorry, I think it's back to front, a detail of how the whole thing is held together. And it's very simple ball joints, because you have to let the glass rotate as the whole thing moves. Because if you think about it, as the cable net begins to sort of curve, those um, the glass has to stay f in f series of flat planes, so you have to make sure it can move in those joints. But a secondary problem is that what I was talking about was if you can't get that cable right next to the weight of the glass, the whole thing actually wants to start twisting upwards. If you can imagine, the weight of the glass is pulling that down, and therefore, if that was on its own, it would pull up. So you have to put in a second cable which actually balances all the loads out. And that, coming back to where one of the things I started off with, um, again, I think this is upside down. <laughs> it's, this is the Reina Sophia, and they had to do exactly that in that situation. You've got the, um, this was, it's a different system because the glass, the weight of the glass, um, the lateral forces of the glass here are actually taken back into solid structure. But the weight of the glass is all hung off these, um, tension cables and they have the same problem and Ian Ritchie's produced this beautiful sort of dolphin design which with the second cable which has a tendency to balance things. Um, and these were just some very blue images of the very of the model as it kind of ended up although I think they've made the facades rather too heavy um, and it's still kind of going out to tender at the moment or going through the final designs of being checked by German engineers. And 
I think, I hope that by going through the process we went through with that, you can see how, A, there was kind of a, a development from the very first very simple box, but also how you tend to bring in influences from all sorts of things you've seen, but then you modify them. You don't say, I'm going to do exactly what so-and-so did in Hamburg, but you say, he did it in compression. Could we turn it upside down and do it in tension? Um, and finally, to get back to the lightness, I mean, I hope that in this we were beginning to produce something which with the contrast of the walkway spiraling in and the very light box surrounding it, something which had a contrast which would begin to provide the lightness um, through the engineering that I was talking about. And um, that's where I finish. So if anyone has any questions, uh, speak now. Or that's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs>